Welcome everyone uh, for the second TCS Plus talk of the fall. It's a pleasure to have uh, David Zuckerman from UT Austin uh, joining us today. Before we start, um, let me mention the upcoming talks that we have. So this was a bit of an exceptional uh, scheduling. So next week, again, uh, we have a talk by Ryan O'Donnell. So this will be October 14th. And then we'll resume normal scheduling. So there'll be two weeks uh, break, and then Liang, or one week break, and then Liang Tan will talk, and then every two weeks uh, we'll have talks. So next week, Ryan O'Donnell. Um, so maybe uh, before I introduce the speaker, uh, oh, let me say, so uh, first acknowledge uh, the team working behind the scene, the teens. So there's a lot of work going on that you can't see. Oded Regev, um, Gotam Kamat, Clement Canon, and of course, Thomas Hollenstein, who's doing all the hard uh, technical work today. Um, and so maybe, Thomas, you can uh, go around and introduce the, the groups that are joining us for the, for the seminar. Ah, welcome, Chris. OK. So yeah, we have uh, plenty of groups today. So we have a group from Colombia, organized by Clement Canon. Hello, Columbia University. We have a group at CWI, organized by Job Briet. We have a group. Uh, from Caltech, organized by Piyush. Hello, everyone at Caltech. We have a group at the, from the MIT, organized by British Kamat. Hello, everyone. We have a group from NYU, organized by Shravas Rao. Hello, NYU. Um, we have a group from Harvard as well. Hello, Harvard, organized by Thomas Steinke. Yes, and that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Thomas, and welcome, Shahar. Um, so let me remind everyone, the groups, please uh, make sure you're muted during the talk, but then do ask questions and mute yourselves, speak out. Everyone will hear. We're also testing a new feature today. Um, for those of you watching the YouTube video from our website on Google, there's a little IRC chat channel below it. And you can just log in there and ask questions. We'll be monitoring it. So feel free to say uh, any any thoughts that, we, that you have, and we'll relay them to uh, the speaker. So it's really a pleasure to have uh, David Zuckerman today um, from UT Austin. So David is going is a uh, one of the founders, if there is such a thing, of the field of uh, solar randomness. He got his uh, PhD with Umesh Vazirani at Berkeley in '91. Then he did a short stint at MIT, and since '93 he's been uh, at UT Austin. So huge amounts of work in. Uh, pseudorandomness, pseudorandom generators, extractors. And today, it's really a pleasure uh, to hear David talk about his latest result with his uh, student. Esh, um, I should have asked how. So Eshan Chattopadhyay uh, on constructions of uh, two source extractors that, that break the what had been the state of the art for a long time. David is going to tell us more about this. Uh, so welcome, David. Thank you. And, and thanks. And thanks to all the organizers for all your help. Um, yeah, it's pronounced Ishan Chateaupadier, or that's my best pronunciation. Aha, uh -huh. so I apologize for that. No, Ishan. Yeah. Um, okay, um, thank you and welcome everybody. Um, so this topic is motivated by the amazing utility of randomness in computing. It's widely used in algorithms and distributed computing and cryptography. And for these applications, you want uh, you want your randomness to be high quality. You want uniform, uncorrelated random bits. So in fact, uh, Dodas et al. showed that uh, various cryptographic te tasks like bit commitment, zero knowledge, won't work even if your bits are pretty close to, to random. Um, and of course, it, when you're analyzing a typical randomized algorithm, you assume that you have uniformly random bits that are uncorrelated and independent. Um, but the weak, weak random sources are motivated by the fact that natural sources may be defective. So computers can try to get their random bits from clock drift, thermal noise, or Zener diode, or various operating systems variables. And, um, and oops, sorry. And, and, and these are not, uh, these random bits are not uniform. And weak, so weak random sources arise in other situations as well. So even if you start with uniform random bits, if an adversary learns something about your random bits, 
then conditioned on the adversary's information, what you have is a weak random source. And for this reason, weak sources and are, are, are useful and arise in cryptography. Weak sources also arise in pseudorandom generators when you condition on the state of computation. So even if you're not using a weak random source, but you want to condition, but you just want to fool small space algorithms. Um, so because of all these reasons, it's a very natural and important goal to purify your weak source, to convert your low quality randomness into high quality randomness. So that's, that's the, the high level goal. So given that goal, okay, we need to first establish how we model a weak source. So your first thought might be to use Shannon entropy. This is the most famous measure of, of randomness. Um, the problem with this measure is you could have a distribution that places very high probability on some fixed string. So for example, it places probability 0.99 on the st string of all zeros. And with probability 0 0.01, it's uniform on n bits. So this, this distribution has entropy linear, so it has a reasonable amount of entropy, but you can't hope to do anything with this. Uh, you can always expect error 99% because when the string is all zeros, you can't expect anything interesting to happen. So for, for this reason, it's, it's, it's natural to, to use something, a related notion called the min entropy. So um, it, it's, the, it's defined in this way, as you see on the screen. The, the way to think about it is to take the largest probability, um, you know, take its reciprocal, and take the logarithm of that. And that's, that's the min entropy. So in, in, our, in our scenario here, the min entropy is actually just a constant. Uh, so, so there's hardly any min entropy. So in that sense, we don't expect to be able to do anything. So we're going to use min entropy. Um, and we'll use the notion of, we'll use the notation nk source to mean a source on n bits with min entropy at least k. So the, the way you should think about it is that all strings have probability at most 2 to the minus k. And a special case of this is you have a set of size 2 to the k or, or more, and you have a, a uniformly random element from such a string. So this is a special case of this. And actually, uh, it, um, Sean Goldrick showed that, that, that actually it's enough to deal with this special case. So a general NK source is a convex combination of, of such so-called flat sources. And, and so, so from now on, just think of a source with min entropy K as a uniformly random element from a set of size 2 to the K. OK, so now that that's our model, what do we want to do? Our, our initial goal might be we want to convert this high quality randomness into, excuse me, this low quality randomness into high quality randomness. Um, and we would want it to, to work for any NK source. So in other words, we don't want to construct a different extractor for different NK sources. We just want one de deterministic procedure that works for every NK source. So, uh, so pictorially, we, we, we start with a weak random source on n bits. Um, we apply, we, we'd want to apply a deterministic function, an extractor. And let's just try to get out one uniformly random bit, or something close to uniform. Um, well, it's not that hard to see that this is impossible. Um, and the proof idea is, is pretty simple. Suppose we have such a, de, such a deterministic function. This deterministic function maps some strings to 0 and some strings to 1. So let's say it maps at least half the strings to 0. Well, well, now consider the weak random source that is uniform on the set extractor inverse of 0. But the extractor always outputs 0 on this source, but such a source has min entropy n minus 1. So, so that's a contradiction. So therefore, there's no one source extractor. OK, so what are we going to do with that then? Um, well, there are, there are a few possibilities. So one is to make some assumptions on our weak source. And this has been a productive area of research. Uh, 
bit fixing sources, affine sources, sampleable sources, and a variety of other sources. Um, but let, let's try not to make assumptions. So what, another thing we could do is, is use, use a seeded extractor. So this is to extract randomness using a short uniformly random seed. And this has also been a successful area with many applications, um, but we're not going to pursue that here. In fact, in, in this talk, we're going to imagine that we have two independent weak sources, two or more independent weak sources. So this has the potential to see practical pseudorandom generators. Uh, practical generators try to get entropy from, you know, as I said, from clock drift or various operating systems variables. So if they were able to get it from two or more independent sources, maybe, maybe they could see the uh, generator in that way. Um, uh, um, and this is the focus of the talk. Of course, it's a very natural mathematical and theoretical computer science question, so um, uh, we'll see other ways of viewing this question. So, uh, so, so in this talk, I'm going to continue introducing the talk and state our results. Um, I'm going to we are going to use seeded extractors in this talk, and I'll, I'll define that in two-source extractors and Ramsey graphs. And I'll tell you about uh, techniques that we use. Um, we, use we reduce to some sort of so-called bit-fixing source. I'll explain that, and then I'll explain how to extract using a resilient function. I'll tell you what, what that means. And, and then I'll conclude. Okay, so... Um, a two-source extractor. So what we want now is we have X and Y, they're independent NK sources. So they're independent sources on N, on N bits, each with min entropy K. And now we want a deterministic function extract that extracts, let's say, one bit that's close to uniform. So more formally, the extract, the probability of the extractor outputs one is very close to a half half plus or minus epsilon. We can view this uh, in matrix terms. So now uh, I'll let capital letters denote 2 to the small letters. So big N is 2 to the little n, big K is 2 to the little k. And um, we can reformulate this as constructing a big N by big N matrix such that every big K by K, big K submatrix is roughly balanced. It contains a, an almost equal number of zeros and ones. So you can see the equivalence in that one source, say X, picks out a subset of the rows. The other source, Y, picks out a subset of the columns. And um, this determines a submatrix. So now a random element from, from one of these rows and a random element from one of these columns gives you a random element from, from the submatrix. So if the submatrix is balanced, you'll get an almost random bit. And it's not hard to see this is equivalent. It's also not that hard to use the probabilistic method to show that when k is, is about 2 log n, uh, that such matrices exist. So in fact, most matrices have the property that um, that any 2 log n by 2 log n submatrix is close to balanced. But we want to con construct it explicitly, right? A, an existence argument for an extractor doesn't help if we want an actual extractor. We want, we really want an efficient explicit extractor. So this was a uh, motivated in, in an earlier model by Shanta and Basirani and, and, and Shorn Goldreich asked it in a very similar model, you know, we want an explicit two-source extractor. And again, so now, um, again, by the probabilistic method, it's not hard to show that we have a two-source extractor for min entropy about log n. So now, now we're back to the little letters. So these are the log of the big letters. So so um, this little n is log of, you know, uh, uh, right, we had, um, before it was log, before we had k being log of, excuse me, 2 log big n, and now we have little k equal uh, log of 
little n plus constant. So, so what's known about explicit constructions? Um, okay, so if both sources have min entropy bigger than n over 2, Schor and Goldreich observe that the classic Lindsay's lemma works. In fact, any Hadamard matrix, like just doing the inner product, gives you an extractor for min entropy bigger than n over 2. Um, and this was the best known for, for some time, uh, until 17 years later, Borgan used additive combinatorics to uh, give a construction where the min entropy just needed to be 0.49n. So he shaved just a little bit. Um, also, Ron Ross showed that both sources don't need to be n over 2. It's enough if just one is n over 2. The other could just be a constant times log n. But it remained an elusive goal to get both sources um, to have small entropy. And um, because of that, people worked on trying to construct explicit C source extractors. So Barack and Paul Yatso Vigderson show that uh, uh, you can use a constant number of sources um, and extract with min entropy some constant times n. Rao improved this um, to show a constant number of sources with min entropy, just a, any small polynomial, any polynomial, n to the gamma. And finally, uh, Lee in several works uh, showed that you can actually just extract from three sources with it min entropy poly log n. And this is a great result, uh, but just bear in mind if you convert this to, say, the matrix, now you'll have a, a, a tensor. So really two sources uh, is sort of special because it corresponds to matrices and, and graphs. And in our main result, we, we give an explicit two source extractor when k is just poly log n for, for a large enough constant c like about 74. Um, so uh, going back to, to this, so we, we improved this to just poly log n bits, and the output length is, we showed how to extract one bit. And then Lee built on our work uh, to show how to extract many bits uh, close to the min entropy. Our work has consequences for Ramsey graphs. What's a Ramsey graph? A K-Ramsey graph is a graph with no independent set or clique of size K. And a bipartite K-Ramsey graph is a bipartite graph with no complete or empty K by K subgraph. So it's the bipartite analog. The bipartite version is harder to construct. Erdős in, in the first or one of the first uses of, of the probabilistic method showed that K-Ramsey graphs exists on n vertices when K is uh, about 2 log n. But again, can we construct things, ex can we construct Ramsey graphs explicitly? So a lot of people have worked on this. Oh, before that, um, just pictorially, what we have, you can think of two coloring the edges of the complete bipartite graph, red and green, and if you pick any two sets of size big K, there's approximately the same, same number of red edges between these two sets as green edges between these two sets. So this has been worked on by, by various people for a long time. Again, the Hadamard matrix gives you square root big N. This corresponds to linear min entropy, 2 to the little n over 2. Um, and it was a, a major result when Frankel and Wilson got Got, uh, got sub-polynomials, so 2 to the square root, roughly 2 to the square root log n. And then there were a variety of constructions matching this bound, and uh, Gopalan helped ex explain why they meet this bound. Um, and so th this was a very nice result, but th these don't give bipartite graphs. Um, in the bipart bipartite setting, it was still a struggle to get below square root n, but they did. Um, and then Barak et al. managed to get sub-polynomial and uh, a different Barak et al., Barak Rao, Shalti L. Vigderson, got 2 to the log n to the little o of 1. And um, that was the best known until, until Cohen independently and, and we achieved 2 to the poly log log. So that's a corollary of our work. 
So, in fact, in our right in our work, we want these graphs to be to be approximately balanced. Ramsey graph is a weaker notion where you just don't want all red edges or all green edges. Okay, so that's an, uh, that, those are our results. So now let me try to give an overview of our techniques. So one of our tools is our strong seated extractors. So this is a, a deterministic function that takes two inputs a long, you know, an n bit string, which we think of as long, and a d bit string, which we think of as short. So think of d as log n or so. And it outputs a somewhat long string m. And what happens here is the n bit string is, an, is taken from an nk source, and the d bit string is taken to be uniformly random. Right, so we're adding a small amount of, of randomness, and we want the output to be close to random, close to uniform. So, we, so think of m as bigger than d, although it's actually interesting even if not because we have a strong extractor here, which means that even conditioned on the d bit seed y, the output of the extractor is close to uniform. Okay, so, so that's what a strong seeded extractor is. The extractor output conditioned on the seed is close to uniform. And if we cycle over all seeds y, we get the following view, which is going to be very useful for us. Right, so there's two to the d possibilities for y. This gives two to the d functions f sub y. These are functions on n bits. And they have the property that for any nk source x, most of the fyx are close to uniform. Of course, for different x, there, you know, it will be a different subset of the fy's which are close to uniform. But it's always the case that for any nk source x, most of the fy are close to uniform. And that's, that's the property we want. And there's been a lot of work on this. Um, the explicit, that now the state of the art, we just need a, the c to be logarithmic in n and 1 over epsilon. And we could output almost all the randomness. Our other ingredient is a resilient function. Uh, these are surprising functions. Uh, so they're, a resilient function is a Boolean function with the following property. We're going to think of an adversary controlling a bunch of the coordinates. So um, for any subset of Q coordinates that the adversary controls, um, um, think of the adversary acting last. So we're going to sample the, the coordinates that the adversary does not control. So we're going to sample almost all the coordinates except for q. And what we'd like is that the, is that the function is fixed by, from these other coordinates, because we don't want the adversary to have any control. If the function is not fixed, that means the adversary can decide which function to choose. So we want to say if we uniformly random, randomly sample most of the coordinates, uh, with high probability the function is fixed. So let's look at an example. For example, majority uh, is resilient up to, up to an adversary controlling n to the 0.49 co um, coordinates. This is because you know, if you flip n random bits, you have a standard deviation square root n. So even if an adversary tries to uh, set all of the coordinates under its control to 1 or all of them to 0, it probably won't change the function. So majority uh, is resilient up to close to square root n. On the other hand, parity is terrible, because even if an adversary just controls one coordinate, uh, it has complete control. So it's not, not even one epsilon resilient for any epsilon less than one. So just to clarify, sorry, the definition, so it's for any uh, subset of q coordinates and for any fixing of these values, the probability is larger than 1 minus epsilon. Well, right? the, well the, the adversary gets to choose its values after seeing what the, um, what the other player, what the remaining coordinates are set to. Right, so you do, Oh, I see. As six. Okay, yeah, thanks. Okay, sure. Okay. Right, okay. right yeah. so, so that's important. So a preliminary attempt, um, 
at a two, here's a preliminary attempt at a two-source extractor. In fact, it's an attempt at a one-source extractor, so it can't possibly work, but let's take a look. We'll start with a strong seeded extractor. Um, it works for min entropy k in error epsilon. And again, we're let, we can take k to be quite small here and d to be just logarithmic. X is an nk source. And now we'll, we'll, apply, we'll, apply, we'll cycle over all seeds. So we get two to the little d functions, which we'll call capital D, which is polynomial. We're thinking of epsilon as one over polynomial. So we get a polynomial number of functions. And most of these functions produce a bit that's close to, to uniform. OK, so the ith bit is just the extractor on x and the ith seed. And again, the bad bits can depend on the good bits. That's, that's a big problem. But again, let's try something like majority um, to get a, a bit b. Well, of course, this doesn't work because the, the, it doesn't work for several reasons. One reason is that the uniform bits are arbitrarily correlated. So maybe they're all equal, for example. So the majority isn't going to help us. Uh, right? So if maybe n over 2 plus 1 of the bits are 1, and n over 2 minus 1 of, of the bits are zero and the adversary has uh, has very high control. Um, so to get around this, an important tool is non are non-malleable extractors. This is a strengthening of a strong extractor. So again, it's the same setup. It, it takes two inputs, a long n and a short d. Um, I, won't I won't give the actual definition, but a corollary um, is the following. Um, so just as in a strong extractor, we get capital D functions, think of a polynomial or so. We get capital D functions Fy such that for any nk source x, most of the Fy are close to uniform. So that's what we had with the strong extractor. But now we have this extra condition that, that the good Fy of x are almost Ty's independent. So this is a much stronger condition. And in very recent work by Chattopadhyay, Goyal, and Lee, uh, they gave a, an explicit construction where d is um, just some polylog value times polynomial in t. So you should think of t as being polylog. Um, so this gives, you, gives us, just using a polylog n bit seed, when k is polylogarithmic, so we have a polylogarithmic min entropy, the output length is, is linear, although we're not going to care about the output length, really. Um, so, so this is a very nice construction. So now with the strengthening, it's natural to try the same approach. Sorry, sorry. sorry David, can I again yeah. ask a simple clarification? So by good Fy are Ty's independent, you mean that um, among the good Ys, if you select any T of them, then the distribution, the, the, the t uniform, approximately uniforms that you have are approximately independent. Right, yeah, Is thank that you. Right? Yeah, so I the t refers to t of the y's, okay. Right, I should have defined ty's independent. ty's independent means any, if you look at any t coordinates, they're independent. So almost ty's independent means you, if any t of these is very close to independent. And that's, that's the situation we have. Thanks. So that motivates our second attempt. Let's just use non-malleable extractors. So we'll make the uniform bits almost t-wise independent. We'll use the non-malleable extractor I just described. So it's the same exact uh, idea, except now we'll use the non-malleable extractor. Um, now d is going to be quasi-polynomial, but let's not worry about that for the moment. And uh, not surprisingly, this doesn't work. Uh, we, the number of bad bits is going to end up being bigger than square root d. And again, we can't even hope that this works because we only have one source. So our approach at a very high level is the following. Um, our first step is to use x and y to construct a string z on a polynomial number of bits such that almost all the bits are uniform and polylogwise independent. And then our, our second step is an explicit extractor for this string z. We won't be able to use majority. We'll have to use something else. 
Okay, so um, so let's see what we're doing. Okay, so when we um, so let's look at our where we were trying to execute step one. We took this NK source, we applied our non-malleable extractor, we got this quasi-polynomially big string where the good bits are almost t-wise independent. Um, and the number of bad indices is, is pretty small. So think of epsilon as one over polynomial. So it's, it's small, but it's not super small given that d is actually quasi-polynomial. So, um, so to make, to make the number of bad indices really small, what we're going to do is, is sample a pseudo-random subset of this string. Okay, and so let's look at that. Well, it doesn't matter. Okay, so now the reason this is going to help us is, um, you know, this fraction of bad indices was, was pretty small, like one over polynomial, but we had a quasi-polynomially long string. By sampling a pseudo-random subset, we're going to hope to maintain the, the fraction of bad indices to be a similar epsilon fraction, but now we'll have a much smaller string. And the fact that we have a much smaller string means that um, the number of bad indices is, is really quite small compared to the size of the string. So our pseudo Wait, so, sorry. sorry again. Um, why does it matter? So the, um, can you say again why the absolute number seems to matter more than just the, the density? Um, it, because it, it seems, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're going to... Really, we want the, we're going to want the number of bad indices to be something like the length to the 0.99, um, right? Um, or, or if we were going for majority, majority won't ah, work. Okay. Right. Um, so you, okay. Right, so if we wanted, like, for example, for majority, we would want okay. the number of bad indices to be something like square root the length, right? But square root the length of polynomial, if it was quasi-polynomially long, then the square root of that would still be quasi-polynomial. And we would really want epsilon to be 1 over quasi-polynomial. But, but we only have epsilon to be um, right. 1 over polynomial. So by Thanks. shrinking it, it, it helps us. I won't go into this in too much more detail because um, Lee actually gave an alternate way to achieve this um, before us, so actually just by slightly modifying his construction, we could achieve what we want to. This is, our view is, it's a little more modular, um, but his works too. So I want to focus mostly on step two. Okay. So now we have this string Z where most of the bits are close to uniform, we just have a, a few bad bits. The number of bad bits is like m to the 0.99. And the good bits are polylog wise independent. And we'll call this distribution D. So now we're going to try to extract from such a source. We're going to extract using some sort of circuit C. And again, we're going to be interested in the probability that C is not fixed by the good bits. We want it to be fixed by the good bits because we don't want the adversary to have control. Okay, so let's. So our, our first step is even the, the good bits are polylog wise independent, but we're going to show that for the purposes of analysis, we can assume that they're um, completely uniform and independent. Um, and we're going to, there are two ideas here. So the first idea is that we can test whether C of X is fixed by a, a similar looking circuit. So if C is monotone. So we're, for this reason, we're going to look for a monotone circuit. So if C is monotone, then by just comparing, if we substitute in zero for the adversary's values versus one for the adversary's values, Right. The only way, if these are different, then the adversary has control. But if these are the same, then the adversary can't do anything. 
because then these will be equal no matter what the adversary chooses. Zero, all zeros and all ones are the two extreme values. So we can just compare the all zero and the all one string. So if C is monotone, then the probability that C is not fixed equals the probability that C prime of X is one. It's just the probability that C of X with the zero string is different than C of X with the one string. And now the other idea is to use Braverman's result. Braverman showed that for any function in AC0, AC0 again is constant depth polynomial size circuits. So he showed that if for any function in AC0, the probability, um, excuse me, this is fooled by polylogwise independence. So if C, if C is in AC0, then so is C prime. C prime just adds one to the depth uh, of C. So we start with C in AC0, then we get C prime in AC0, and then by using Braverman we say that the probability that C prime is one is about, is the same more or less when X is chosen according to a polylogwise independent distribution as when it's chosen according to the uniform distribution. Okay, and, and so for this reason, um, it follows that um, th this gives us exactly what we want because we're, we're, in we're interested in a small probability of C prime being one. That is, we're interested in a small probability of C not being fixed. So let's, yeah, okay, so here, here's a summary. So if, so if C is in AC zero and monotone, then the probability that C is not fixed under the polylogwise independent distribution is very close to the probability that's not fixed under the uniform distribution. And for this reason, we can um, just do our analysis from the uniform distribution. Okay, so from now on, we're going to assume that the good bits are independent and uniform. And we're going to try to construct an, a circuit in AC0 that's monotone. And our construction doesn't have to, the time to construct it, our process of constructing it doesn't have to be in AC0. We just have to output a circuit that's in AC0 and monotone. But our process of constructing C doesn't have to be in AC0 and monotone. So, so again, our remaining task is to construct a monotone circuit in AC0 on M bits such that C is resilient against M to the 0.99 bad players and it's almost unbiased. So it should be close to 50-50 of being zero and one. And we want to construct this circuit in polynomial time. As I said before, it's not necessary to do it in AC0, even though C itself has to be in AC0. And we're going to construct this circuit C by de-randomizing I tie lineal. So let me tell you about I tie lineal. Um, this is a function that's resilient to coalitions of size n over log squared n. So you might think, your first thought might be that majority is the most resilient function. It, it seems very natural, but it turns out you can actually do much better. This I tie lineal function can tolerate some small constant times n over log squared n bad players. So majority also you don't have in AC0, right? Or? And majority is not in AC0, that's another problem. So the I-tie linear function, I got cut off a little, it's, it's based on what we call the tribes function. So tribes function is just a DNF on, on disjoint variables. So think of um, tribes of size about log n. So it's just, so these are ands of log n variables. And we take an or of these n over log n tribes. And, um, and that's a tribe. The I tie lineal function is not a tribe. A tribe is not resilient because if an adversary just controls a tribe, it can always force the function to one. What I tie and lineal did is say they took the and of a, of a bunch of tribes where these tribes are, are um, computed on different partitions. And 
And not only are they computed on different partitions, but you randomly negate some of the variables. So some intuition is roughly that, and that it's hard for an adversary, right? An adversary's goal is sort of to control a tribe or else to control one player in each, tri in each, in each tribe, but that's a lot of bits, right? That's n over log n bits to control one bit in each tribe. So it's easier for an adversary to control a tribe. But if these, but if these um, partitions are, are nice looking, it's going to be hard for the adversary to control a tribe in each of the um, partitions. And uh, the, again, they showed this n over log squared n bound. So the problems, uh, their, their, uh, their construction is probabilistic. So if we just use it directly, uh, it would take us time n to the n squared to de-randomize it. And it's also not monotone. It required random negations. So we're going to de-randomize it. So our key construction, the key ingredient is an explicit construction of partitions that behave nicely. Um, so one property that's key is that what, any small subset, so think of this small subset as n to the 0.99 coordinates controlled by an adversary. This should have small intersection with most partitions. And what I mean by here, here is with most blocks in any partition. It has small intersection with a partition if it has small intersection with um, every block in that partition. So that's what we really want. We want it, it's good if the adversary's control is sort of spread out among the different tribes. And that's what we want. We want, um, for most partitions, the adversary's control is spread out. Yeah, small again means n to the 0.99. And this part is used to bound the influence, the power of the adversary. Um, the other property we're going to need is, is that the partitions are pairwise pseudorandom in the sense that the intersection of any two blocks is, is bounded. And this is used to bound the bias. You might think the bias is trivial, just showing probability one half, but in this construction it, it requires some work. It actually takes longer in our paper, I think. Okay, so, so how do we construct this pseudorandom collection of partitions? Well, again, we go back to seeded extractors. So a seeded extractor can be viewed as a graph. Um, on the left side of the graph are all possible weak source inputs to the extractor, and on the right side are all possible outputs of the extractor. Um, now usually an extractor is viewed by starting with the weak source and looking at how it spreads to the other side. We start with a weak source. Um, when we apply a random seed to this, we get close to uniform. Then, but here I'm going to describe an alternate view of an extractor. We start with a, a subset on the right side. This is some sort of test set. To te it's, think of T as a test of whether the string is uniform. Um, and what this, what this property says is that, um, okay, if we start with a test set, every node on the left gives us an estimate of the size of T. In particular, just the fraction of its neighbors that land in T. Right, so, the, so, that, so each node on the left, that fraction, the fraction of neighbors that land in T gives us an estimate of the fractional size of T. And we'll say a node is bad if if this estimate is is larger than is larger by epsilon than it should be. So the fraction of neighbors that land in T is the fractional size of T plus epsilon, if it's more than that. So these are the bad nodes. And the property of the extractor, it's not hard to show that the number of bad nodes has to be less than two to the K. Because if it's at least two to the K, then if you took a uniformly random element from this set and took a uniformly random neighbor, it would hit T in more than, more than epsilon, in the density of T plus epsilon, which it's not supposed to. 
Okay, so if you didn't follow that proof, it's a you know it's probably hard if I'm I didn't really give you a slide here, but just accept that the that the seeded extractor has this property that for any set T on the right, the number of bad elements on the left is small. Um, so we're going to use this this to construct the partitions. Well, first, an extractor doesn't look like a partition. Um, but let's see how to construct a partition. So an extractor output we could think of as, as a set here. So um, um, so M, M describes the possible outputs, and B now describes the seeds. So for each seed, we're going to get a possible output. Um, so our set takes, so our, our set SI um, okay, each node on the left is going to describe a set. So there were, let me go back. There are R nodes on the left, and we're going to get R sets. Okay, so each set, we can think of each set as, as being described by the, its neighbors. So there are going to be R sets, and each set is described by, so 1 refers to seed number 1, and then I1 refers to what, what the extractor does on seed number 1. Then we would have 2, I2, etc. So we see, for each seed, we see what the extractor outputs. The main point of this is just, we want, I'm just saying that we have a set in this special form that it's described by a function. So it's a function, and now how do we get a partition from this one function? Well, we start shifting. We just add one to the output of this function. And we cycle around, and we get uh, a partition. So each set SI defines a partition given by the set, the set plus one, the set plus two, et cetera. OK, so, um, so again, each SX is just yeah, I should have had this slide before. So each Sx is just 1, the extractor of x and 1, 2, the extractor of x and 2, b, the extractor of x and b. So each Sx is just a function that looks like this. And the properties that we require are, again, that any any set T of bad coordinates of size at most n to the point 99 has small intersection with partitions. And um, for any two different x and x prime, the neighbors of x plus i and the neighbors of x prime plus j intersect in a, in a small amount. Not even that small, just 0.9 times b. b is the maximum length. And uh, we show that Trevisan, Trevisan's extractor satisfies these properties. So the second property is is a is a somewhat more general version of uh, the design extractor that was uh, used by Lee. Um, so that's a high level view. I'll just state some more ingredients that go in our analysis. Um, well. We give a new way of analyzing the bias. Um, a useful inequality is Janssen's inequality. So Janssen's inequality says that if we have any subsets of the universe U, if we pick each element in U independently and with probability P, we get a random set R. And if the SIs are small and have low pairwise inter pairwise intersection, then the probability that all the SIs are not contained in R is similar to the product of these probabilities. So this is useful in analyzing the bias, and it's a useful inequality that maybe uh, should be used more. So since our work, there have been a, a few follow-up papers. So Lee used our construction to give an explicit affine extractor for polylog min entropy. 
also showed how to improve our output length to 0.9 times the entropy. And Mecca gave an explicit resilient function matching the i tie lineal bound of n over log squared n. Um, and he also improved the constant. You know, our, our construction worked for entropy like log, log n to the 74, and now he has it down to something like log n to the 10 for constant error or log n to the 18th for polynomially small error. So open questions. Um, one nice thing would be to try to get negligible error. We achieved error like 1 over polynomial, which is not enough for cryptographic applications. And what about min entropy constant times log n? This would give, um, this is kind of special because it would give Ramsey graphs, it would give poly log n Ramsey graphs instead of 2 to the poly log log. Um, although if the min entropy C log n, we can't hope for negligible error, but even for Ramsey graphs, we just need any non trivial error. And maybe most interestingly or intriguingly is to give more applications. Can we, uh, can we use these results or techniques elsewhere? Um, right, so affine extractors were used in circuit lower bounds. Can we, can we get uh, more circuit lower bounds? You know, th there's a variety of things that might be useful. Okay, and th that's it. Any questions? Thanks. Um, I'm the only one who's unmuted, so uh, <laughs> I'm sure everyone's clapping. Um, questions from the audience? So, audiences. We have time, so feel free to ask uh, questions. Maybe I can get us started. I was, I was curious about the error because it didn't really show up explicitly during the talk and so, so can I so 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 first the um, so this exponent in the uh, n that you achieve how does it um, relate to the parameters so if I want n cubed instead of n squared or something how is that going to show up in the also exponent that I need uh, in the polylog for the source or am I just stuck at whatever value you have or oh I see um, yeah, that's a good question. Old, that's yeah. I guess maybe the, the second question, which is the same, maybe, is just how can you just say a few words on how it comes in, uh, the error, how you get whatever you get. Right, so, so actually we got error, originally we got error n to the minus 0.01, so just some small error, but uh, Lee showed that actually basically the same, uh, a small modification gives, gives any polynomially small error. Um, and so... The any polynomially small, then then um, how is it going to affect the requirements? Right. Um, um, I'd have to take a look. I, I'm not sure it it affects it that much. Um, okay. So there is no way, standard way to boost this. Um, no, I don't think it's. I don't think you can sort of. I don't think if you're given just a general extractor that achieves error 1 over n squared, you could boost it to 1 over n cubed. I mean, with seeded extractors, there is a way to do that. But I don't think there's a way in general to do that. And so can you, is it, is it possible to say something about uh, the bottleneck there? So what, what, you know, what got you n to the point, minus point 0.1? And so, yeah, the problem, the, the bottleneck is the resilient function. So the, the error for the resilient function, like even if there's, so, um, right, so we were dealing with strings of length m, and even if the adversary just controls one, one coordinate, the adversary should have, should be able to make the error at least one over m. In fact, by a more complicated, res, you know, con collilineal, it's really log m over m. But besides that, just, right, so the adversary, and the adversary controls m to the 0.99 coordinates, so you'd expect the adversary, the error to be something like 1 over m to the 0.01. So, all you, so a way to reduce the error is just to make m bigger, that's all. Um, and, um, um, but, but you can't make m bigger than, 
m can be at most, po at most polynomially large, so the error is going to be at most, it's going to be at least 1 over m, which is still 1 over polynomial. So if there are a way to get, to somehow implicitly get a circuit to operate on, on bigger strings, maybe we could do something. But the bottleneck is in the resilient function. Uh, just a question. Existentially, how small can the error be made? Exponential? Yeah, it should be exponential in, in k, something like 1 over 2 to the k. Uh, but it won't. It will be something like, you know, poly and n, poly and n over 2 to the k. So when k is at least, yes, yeah, so maybe it's something like, uh, you know, n squared over 2 to the k. So when, when k is bigger than to log n, it starts getting exponentially small. Something like that. Um, so, yeah, so it would be nice to achieve, to achieve exponentially small error in k. Are there other questions? David, uh, is, is Mecca's construction uh, monotone? Yeah. I see. So, so can it be used somehow to simplify your construction? It seems almost as if the one source extractor would work now, given Mecca's um, um, uh, function. No. Well, we know it can't. Uh, so, um, no. Again, there's the problem with the error that we. Um, right. So. So we're still using the non-malleable extractor that, that has a seed of length uh, poly log n. So um, if we just tried the one source extractor, we would have a string of length quasi polynomially long. And again, a, like a 1 over polynomial fraction of these bits would be bad. Um, I see. Oh, but you're saying that then, uh, I see what you're saying, right? The, um, there's also the issue of the almost polylog n wise independence that um, right it's almost but but that that error with the almost will mess you up if you if you don't look at a subset that's another problem so if you um, yeah it's it's not going to work because of the almost polylog right. independence thanks Any any other questions? So you skipped over the the sort of the use of the second uh, source, and you, you said it was being used to sample a subset of the the seeds for the first one. Uh, is there anything more you can say about how that gets used? Yeah, so it's a. Um, yeah, so we, let's go back to them. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, we're sampling. So here again, we're going to, we use a seeded extractor to do the sampling with the other source. So, um, um, again, it has, now we're using the sampling property of, of an extractor, that an extractor is a good sampler. So, um, so we just use, use that property. Um, we just want to hit, you know, the proper number of good bits, and um, an extractor will do that with high probability, e even if it comes from a weak random source. So, so we're just using that sort of basic property, the, the sampling property, well, it's, it's I guess it's a combination because we want it to be a good sampler even even when the value is chosen from a weak random source. But we'll we'll have you know we'll have um, we'll use an ex you know we want our we'll use an extractor that works actually for entropy k over two. So our extractor is 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 really good. We have min entropy k, and that sort of allows us to to do the sampling. So basically, you take the other source you 
pop it into an extractor, and then you consider all possible seeds for that. Right. And those right. will give you the points that you sample. Yeah, exactly. OK. Yeah, I should have said that. Right. So there's a polynomial number of seeds for this strong extractor. That will give us polynomial many, uh, many coordinates. And, um, and I should say also that this whole thing can be done in polynomial time. Even though this string was quasi-polynomially long, it can be done in polynomial time because we, do, we only need to um, compute the non-malleable extractor for the seeds given by this, for, for the polynomial number of seeds of our, of our sampling extractor. Right, so we, um, so the extract, so the, this sampling extractor gives us the seeds to use in, in the non-malleable extractor. And, and it's all polynomial time. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Thomas, you were checking if we had any questions on the IRC thing, right? Yes. I looked. We, we did not see. Yeah. yeah. There's no questions there. Yeah. Um, do we have more questions from the audience for David? If not, I'll take us on off, offline. Everyone's welcome to hang out for longer, though. Uh, let me just remind our viewers that next week uh, we have a talk again by Ryan O'Donnell um, from CMU, who will tell us uh, how to refute a random CSP. Um, OK, so before we go offline, thanks a lot, uh, David Zuckerman, uh, for the talk. And uh, we'll see you all next week.